The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him there. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them into, back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of, herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might come with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It is said that Mother Teresa can be quoted saying, if you judge people, there's no time to love them. I wonder how many times I've done that in my life, made that split-second judgment that leaves me angry or annoyed about someone instead of curious about who that person really is. For instance, that person who's cut in front of me in the line I've been waiting for for 30 minutes. Or that person who's driving in my blind spot and won't speed up and they won't slow down and I need to get over and it's so frustrating. Or that person who vehemently disagrees with my perspective or opinion. And you know, we often get so mad at those people but it's hard to remember that their perspective comes from their own lived experiences. The truth is, we encounter people all the time that we don't know and will maybe never see again, but we judge almost immediately and determine who they are by their looks or their actions. I have a story I'd like to share this morning. This is called Eric's Old Man, and it's from Chicken Soup for the Christian Soul by Nancy Dahlberg. Our family was driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles on Christmas Day. That year, Christmas came on Sunday, and we needed to be in Los Angeles on Monday morning, having spent Christmas Eve and Christmas morning with my husband's parents. We stopped for lunch at a diner in King City, I was enjoying a review of the happiness and meanings of the day when my reverie was interrupted. I heard Eric, our one-year-old son, scream with glee in his high chair. Hi there! Two words he thought were one, 
He pounded his fat baby hands, whack, whack, on the metal tray of the high chair. His face was alive with excitement, eyes wide, gums bared in the toothless grin. He wriggled and chirped and giggled. And then I saw the source of his merriment. A tattered rag of a coat, greasy, worn, baggy pants, both they and the zipper at half-mast over a spindly body, toes that poked out of the would-be shoes, a shirt that had ring around the collar all over, and a face like none other, gums as bare as Eric's, hair unwashed, uncombed, unbearable, whiskers too short for a beard but way beyond the shadow stage, and a nose so varicose that it looked like the map of New York. I was too far away to smell him, but I knew he smelled. His hands were waving in the air, flapping about on loose, loose wrists. Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see a buster. Eric continued to laugh and call, hi there. Every call was answered. I shoved a cracker at Eric, and he pulverized it on his tray. I turned the high chair. Eric screamed and twisted around to face his old buddy. The waitress's eyebrows were rising. Several diners went, <clears throat> this old geezer was creating a nuisance with my beautiful baby. And now the bum was shouting from across the room, do you know Peekaboo? Hey, look who knows Peekaboo. The old guy was drunk. Nobody thought anything was cute. My husband was embarrassed. I was humiliated. Even our six-year-old wanted to know why that man was talking so loud. We ate hurriedly and in silence. All except Eric who continued to run through his repertoire with the bum. My husband rose to pay the check, telling me to meet him in the parking lot. I grabbed Eric and headed for the exit. The old man sat poised and waiting, his chair directly between me and the door. Lord, let me out of here before he speaks to me or Eric. I tried to sidestep to put my back between Eric and any air the old man might be breathing, but Eric, with his eyes riveted on his best friend, leaned far over my arm, eyes riveted on his best friend's, leaned far over, reaching out in a baby's pick-me-up gesture. And in the split second of balancing my baby and turning to counter his weight, I came eye to eye with the old man. His eyes were imploring. Would you let me hold your baby? There was no need to answer. Eric propelled himself from my arms into the man's and immediately laid his head on the man's ragged shoulder. The man's eyes closed, and I saw tears hover beneath, beneath the lashes. His aged hands, full of grime and pain and hard labor, gently, so gently, cradled my baby's bottom and stroked his back. The old man stroked and rocked, then he opened his eyes and looked squarely in mine. He said in a firm, commanding voice, you take care of this baby. I said, I will. He pried Eric from his chest, unwillingly, longingly, as though he were in pain. I held my arms open to receive my baby, and again the gentleman addressed me, God bless you, ma'am. You've given me my Christmas present. What are the assumptions that we make about people that we see in our daily life? In this case, someone living on the street, sturdy and tattered and poor. And even if we see them lovingly, do we still make assumptions about why they are there? Who of us ever asks? But then there's Jesus the one who always asks, kind of like Eric, the baby, whose curiosity is never-ending. Have you ever noticed that in a large percentage 
of Jesus' personal conversations or direct conversations within a set of people, a group, that he often speaks using questions. Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? Who among you is without sin? Why do you seek the dead instead of the living? What things are they saying about the Son of Man? Who do you say that I am? Do you love me? In today's lesson, what is your name? Jesus speaks to the disciples, the Jews, and the leaders of the Jews, such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the other priests and leaders in the temples. Jesus also speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well, and he heals the Syrophoenician woman, both Gentiles. He eats with prostitutes, unethical tax collectors and sinners, the sick, the poor, the unclean. Jesus casts demons out of a Jerusalem, also a Gentile, not a Jew. In all these stories of who Jesus spends time with, Jesus looks at all people, not from what he sees on the outside so much as what their heart looks like. Jesus seeks out the good that he knows is there because we were all created good, one in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, because we are all one in Christ. What an appropriate message for today, June 19th, Juneteenth. Something we need to hear every day. This is what we're to look for in people every day. The good, the Christ in each one of us. Because somewhere, it's deep down in there. We are what our life and experiences teach us. We are products of our environments as much as we are of our nature. And we all mess up. How many times... Am I angry at that person on the road that cuts me off until I realize one day when I'm running terribly late for something important and I'm driving too fast and changing lanes? And I'm always aware of it, especially when I'm wearing this, because I'm like, oh gosh, I should probably drive nicer than that, you know? (laughs) But it's then, in that moment, that it's me that cuts someone off. It's me that says something horrible to the cashier of the store, it's way above their pay grade. It's me that shares harsh words with a loved one when really I'm reacting to something much deeper than this particular situation that has triggered my pain. Jesus has come for all people to remind us that we are all God's children. We are all recipients of God's grace and mercy, even when we are the sinner and the righteous judge. Deep down, we all have our demons that need to be cast out. And this, this is the gift of being made one in Christ. Jesus looks at each of us and says, hmm, I wonder what's behind that. And then washes us in the waters of baptism and says, there you are. I see you. Amen.